welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good break. Uh, for those of you that listened to our banter, uh, I hope you found it interesting and edifying. I'd like to introduce this next panel to you. This is a cool panel. It's one of the ones I'm most excited about the whole day. Um, maximizing the value of training in cyber ranges. We have some true thought leaders here from really instrumental organizations. They're going to share with us some of their ideas for how they can integrate CTFs and cyber ranges into developing, retaining, building their workforce. It's, it's really cool stuff. Um, let me just go through the uh, set of panels that we have here for you. Uh, each of these folks is is good friend. Um, we've got Dean DeBeer, who's a co-founder and CTO of ThreatGrid, now part of Cisco Systems. Uh, Dean is an old friend of mine. We've we know we've known each other for 15 years or maybe more. Dean yeah. is a security technologist with a background in malware analysis, incident response, and threat intelligence. Uh, he is the product line CTO for Advanced Threat Security Group at Cisco. He focuses on developing platforms for intelligence and response automation to defend against advanced threats. He came to Cisco as part of the Threat Grid acquisition. Uh, the guy's amazing. Uh, he's involved in building training and leading penetration testing, incident response, threat analysis for a wide variety of different organizations. We also have Kerry McLeish, who is a cybersecurity practice director at Tuvli. Uh, it's an ACME company. Um, Kerry uh, engages customers by advising business leaders and C-level executives in cyber risk and security. She also deals with cyber compliance, defensive capabilities. I first met Carrie probably 12, 13 years ago um, when she was uh, working in the Army, uh, doing some really incredible stuff. Uh, she served in the 101st Airborne Division of the US Army. Uh, she's got over 30 years experience in practical cybersecurity with strategic planning, tactical operations, policy and doctrine development, amazing. Next is Nick Wood, Chief Technologist from Booz Allen Hamilton. He started his career in 2002 in the cybersecurity industry, working for Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab and Geek Squad and Lockheed Martin, and most recently at Booz Allen Hamilton. He supported a whole bunch of challenging technical roles. He was a sysadmin, exploit analyst, intrusion analyst. Um, today, he's the chief technologist at Booz Allen Hamilton. He's got a team of highly talented analysts working uh, with their clients on some of their most challenging analytical problems. I've met some of the folks on his team. They're amazing, really cool. We also have David Cohen. He is Managing Director with KPMG. He's a certified SANS instructor. And he started his career as a pen tester back in 1996, uh, doing some information security consulting. Um, he also does a lot of DFIR work and is a SANS DFIR instructor. Uh, here's, a, here's a quote from him that I thought was particularly great. Uh, not only did I find huge technical challenges to tackle and master, but I also found clients who deeply cared about the work I was doing and directly benefited from its results. He got tremendous job satisfaction working in DFIR. Yep, uh, he's got a team now of expert digital forensics investigators that work for him, pushing the boundaries of what is possible on a daily basis. Um, and he's the red team captain for the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, that's CCDC. And finally, we've got Jason O'Dell, who's Senior Director of Incident Management at Walmart. Now, somebody sent me a message from Jason's team earlier today. I won't name who it is, but I'm sure Jason will be able to figure it out. But this person sent me a message saying, hey, I'd like you, when you introduce Jason, to mention this, because this is how cyber ranges and CTFs have changed my life and how my work under Jason has been impacted by this stuff. Uh, he mentions here that he went to an ISSA uh, session on a hack the flag. He said he made it rain shells and was caught up in a vector of excitement and swept with emotion. Uh, then uh, George Orchilis presented him as a first place winner in a beginner tournament. He had no idea that he had these skills before that tournament, but he learned the, the, the excitement of this from a CTF. And then as he worked his way through the career, his career, uh, he got a job at Walmart uh, working on Jason's team. Uh, and Jason has encouraged him to build his skills through CTFs and uh, various cyber range experiences. Um, he wrote, none of that could have been achieved without being on a great team and working with the other great teams. Uh, thank you, Jason O'Dell, for hiring me, for selecting me to do cyber ranges and thank you for our great team at Walmart who encourage a culture of self-development, I'm tearing up here, uh, and have provided me with the greatest level of support in the hardest moments of my life. Jason is the Senior Director of Incident Management at Walmart, where he leads the teams responsible for data assurance, cyber intelligence, and security operations, incident response, and cyber. And you're a busy guy, Jason. He has over 15 years of security experience. Um, Jason was previously responsible for all aspects of an MSSP, providing services to over a thousand financial institutions. Um, he's uh, presented at many conferences, keynoted many, uh, including speaking at RSA. Um, 
it's just a delight to have Jason here with us. So this is quite a cool panel. See what I said? Uh, I promised you. But I'd like to start out by asking a question of Dean. So let's go with Dean first. Uh, Dean, please give us a little background about your team and how you've used cyber ranges and CTFs to help build their skills. Uh, if you could give us like a minute or, or two on that, we'd love to hear. Uh, absolutely. Um, so back in the, the days at Threadcrit, uh, it was a very different environment as opposed to today at Cisco, where we have very large uh, engineering teams of, of all different levels of experience and types. Uh, during the Cisco days, you know, we're heavily focused on malware. Sorry, the Threadcrit days, we're heavily focused on malware analysis. So the team was made up of folks that had backgrounds in reverse engineering, vulnerability um, management, and uh, discovery, um, incident response, malware analysis, et cetera. Right? Coming to Cisco, you end up in very large environments with, um, with teams where you end up hiring uh, developers that don't have backgrounds in security. And that's to be expected, right? You're not gonna find every developer is gonna have uh, security experience, especially in you know, the more advanced threat spaces that we deal with. Um, things like cyber ranges uh, and quite honestly, uh, even um, hack knees or uh, you know, single, uh, you know, single ta single tasks or tests like a, you know um, are things that we've used you know throughout our interview process as well as training uh, post interview uh, to hire folks. Um, you know the interview processes that we use today, uh, especially on the research team, um, you know cover everything from uh, you know looking at Windows lo event logs uh, through to uh, here's a report generated by a sandbox. You know read it back to us and explain what you found, what was missing. Um, you know, so, you know, things like cyber ranges and CTFs, you know, they build upon, um, upon those questions that we ask of the teams. Uh, it becomes a more formal environment for them to practice and learn. Uh, and especially when you have folks that aren't security practitioners to start, any form of training, you know, makes a big difference to the quality of product that you develop. Um, you know, we, you know, having a small number of security professionals and subject matter experts drive product development uh, is only, it's not, it's not a really scalable proposition. So providing knowledge to folks, whether they be on the UI UX front um, or, you know, engineering, um, you know, new tools or new engines for analysis makes a world of difference to the quality of product that you end up producing. Yeah, it's so true. You told me that story last week about how you wrote a, a little CTF embedding some data inside of some packets for your team. And I think that's a, a really cool thing. A lot of fun. Uh, let's let's move to Carrie next. Um, hey, Carrie, I've known you for a long time. You've got a lot of experience on different kinds of ranges, military ranges, uh, civilian government ranges, commercial. Um, what's one of the biggest lessons that you've learned in what makes for a successful range experience in building skills? Uh, well, I, I think you have to know the intent. I think it's really important, obviously, to, to know the intent, um, obviously, because you want to know what you're getting out of the range. But also, I'm sure you've heard of this little thing called scope creep and uh, <laughs> the cloud, like the cloud, um, cyber range is really a cool term and I want one. Um, but then every, everyone, if someone finds out you have one, then everyone wants to use it. And uh, so I think it's important to know the intent of um, why you have a range and what you're trying to get out of it. And also, um, you know, when you put the price tag of a range up in front of someone, they're a little shocked, you know, a little sh uh, sticker shock. And um, there are lots of other free ranges out there available. There's other um, capture the flag, um, you know, um, SANS um, Holiday Hack Fest has been around, I think, for as long as I've known you. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, but, I think uh, about 20 years. We're about 20 years now. Yeah. yeah and, um, you know, so that's always free. Um, and then, uh, like, Google has a capture the flag. Um, there, there are many other tools out there. So, yeah, again, I think intent and what you want to do with it is, um, is the lesson that I've learned and then kind of uh, um, frame the expectations so that, um, whoever's the bill payer or whoever says they want a range knows what to expect and what they can get out of it. And I think maybe that's wise. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, up front, you know, are you using this for recruitment? Are you using it for skill development? Are you using it for evaluation? Are you using it for um, maybe retention or maybe team building? There's so many different w ways you can use this and being purposeful up front and not just saying, well, just use it and hoping that that stuff happens. That's, that's, that's not optimal. Um, so thanks, Carrie. Great insights. Um, Nick, 
you and your team have participated in a lot of cyber range events. And I know you've given us some feedback on ours and it's always been uh, really interesting and really useful. Uh, how do you characterize the, the best cyber ranges and, and what are you looking for in finding something that will give you, you know, a lot of value for your team? Yeah, great question. So um, I'd say the, the best, most polished uh, cyber range that, you know, my colleagues and I have participated in is probably net wars and oh only because uh, the hint system that's built in really ranges from allowing somebody who's just entering into the, uh, the field to, to really kind of uh, not necessarily stumble through, but really kind of just start at that really junior level and, and, and advance their skills pretty quickly. Um, but then when you lead NetWars into the Tournament of Champions, where you can really go toe to toe with some of the most challenging you know, competitors, uh, you know, across the country, across the world, you know, that, that's just a really unique environment uh, that we haven't really seen anywhere else. Um, but the second um, environment that I would say I personally enjoyed the most was uh, CCDC, the, the College Cyber Defense Competition. So when I was studying for my master's degree, uh, I think this was the 2009 competition. You know, I got to meet a ton of folks, um, just get pillaged, uh, you know, and destroyed by the, you know, 50 plus red team attackers, you know, all while you're trying to uh, defend a, a small environment. So just the learning curve uh, from focusing on, on such a small event um, is significant. And, and I think that's what really, you know, at the end of the day is the value there. That's really cool. I, CCDC is a tremendous thing. And I encourage people if they can help out with CCDC in any way that they should. Also, Nick, I'd like to personally thank you. You, uh, you push us hard on networks and your comments, your feedback on networks through the years have helped us to make it better. You always give us very, very thoughtful stuff and, and you do push us. It's, so <laughs> hard. Sometimes it's like, wow, he's got a really good point. We got to figure out how to deal with that. And address <laughs> that. But, uh, but I appreciate you bringing up CCDC because that's going to bring us over to David. Um, so David, in your role running the red teams for CCDC, what have you learned that you think every cyber range participant should know? It's a really good question. Uh, CCDC is unique in that our participants are solely in a defensive mode. The only offensive operations are coming from the red team. So there's kind of two big lessons that we've seen that kind of emerged out of our competition. And so the first is how to be an effective uh, kind of an operations uh, cell inside of the operator perspective when you're you know, kind of showing that threat. And that is defining not only uh, common toolkits, common base capabilities, uh, making sure you have some custom developed kits each year to make sure you're not easily picked up by AV. But more importantly on the student side, it's making sure that the, the exercise reinforces lessons through the time period that they should be reinforced by the red team activity. It shouldn't just be a, can I get in and do something funny? It's does this activity reinforce a lesson and a life skill that allows that student when they leave the competition to be able to enter the real world and say, I remember how to react to this. I remember how to do this. I'm ready for this. That's so good. You know, so many people do it backwards. It's really interesting to me. They'd say, well, let's build out an infrastructure mm -hmm. and then later we'll figure out what challenges we can throw on it. You're supposed to start with the learning objectives mm -hmm. and, and build scenarios and then the infrastructure is supposed to enforce that. Well, I wouldn't say we knew on year one, but it's been 15 years now. So we yeah. kind of... <laughs> Live and learn. <laughs> we're, both, we're both getting the great yeah. thing, right? right. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, let's see. Jason, I see you and your team at a lot of uh, hacker conferences and such. Uh, your folks presenting, you presenting at, at various events. Uh, I see your team participating in CTFs there. How do you use cyber ranges and CTFs to build your team's skills and to do it in kind of a, a consistent and um, systematic way? Yeah, sure. You know, I, I think um, there are opportunities to use CTFs and cyber ranges across all of InfoSec. I know specifically at our organization, we've made a large investment over the last few years in detection and response. Um, and, you know, a, a, as a part of that, and I think everybody here understands and knows this, and I'm not going to tout the, the headlines from 2015, you know, there's a cybersecurity shortage, right? Um, but it's really hard to find across the industry in spite of, you know, really aggressive recruiting efforts, um, seasoned incident responders, um, as well as other information security professionals. And so, you know, there's a couple of things there as a byproduct of it, because you can have an incident response, you can have the tooling, you can have the playbooks, you can have all those other, other things. But at the end of the day, it's really the people um, that allow you to have a strong incident response program. Um, so as a part of that, sometimes we find that we're growing our own. 
Um, and so as we're growing our own information security talent, there's a couple of ways for those individuals to acquire the necessary experience. Um, because in spite of playbooks and processes, at the end of the day, it's people making decisions and there are important decisions to be made that need to be tempered with experience and containment eradication. Um, and, and so in order for them to gain experience, there's a couple of different ways they can do that, right? Um, one, they can get it organically. Um, and a lot of us are part of large organizations and we see attacks all the time. So that is certainly a way to gain experience. Uh, but the other way to gain experience is through CTFs and cyber ranges um, that helps accelerate, um, you know, the experience of the talent that you have at, at hand. And, and to your point, Ed, you know, that's one of the reasons, um, you know, whether it be DerbyCon, um, we actually did a presentation a couple of years ago uh, relative to CTFs. Um, we try to participate as much as we can in CTFs. Um, as, as well as we try to lean in and help wherever we can is because we think it's so very important. It gives back to the community and it helps you, you know, your own organization in recruitment and, and also building, you know, a, a reputation. Um, it's really good. Thanks for what you've done uh, for the community. Um, I really do think that this group here represents some thought leading organizations and thought leaders in, in not just building individual skills, but building team skills. And uh, I, I'd like to, to, kind of focus on that next, maybe turning to Dean again. Dean, you've got a very diverse team. You've got folks with all different kinds of capabilities and skills. You mentioned that earlier. Um, how do you select range activities to cover the spectrum of those skills? Or do you kind of slice it and dice it and give different people different things? Or, or how does that work? Oh, God, uh, with difficulty. <laughs> um, so what I've, what I've chosen to do, uh, and uh, unfortunately, this is more of a recent development than I would have preferred, uh, is that as a requirement um, within your first year of being on, on one of my engineering teams today, that you do take some form of security training. Um, what we've said is a baseline standard was actually your original course, SANS 504. Um, and the reason for that, is, and I'll give, I'll give everyone the opportunity to take different courses as well. Uh, some folks, for example, documentation team are not as well versed in security, so they might take an introductory course. Um, and the, the reason for setting a baseline is that, you know, I don't build offensive tooling anymore. It's everything's about defense, right? Whether it be analysis or response or making that more efficient. Um, so the goal behind starting with the training is to ensure that everyone has a baseline understanding of why we do what we do. I can find incredibly talented engineers around the world. We hire for location and not talent, but oftentimes they're coming in saying, well, I'm, I'm you know, proficient in this language. I'm fantastic with you know, building things at a, you know, building large scale infrastructures. Uh, and that's great, but you know, anyone can build a widget, right? Um, understanding why you're building that widget is probably the most important thing that I can instill in my teams today. Um, and as an example, uh, a gentleman that's been with the team for one of my teams now for, I want to say five or six years, uh, he recently took a SANS training. Uh, I think he did um, a Windows forensics one. And he came back and we we're a little horrified um, and said, I finally understand why we do what we do. Oh. Um, and, you know, and that's the problem, right? You have a number of engineering teams, they sort of, they end up in a, you know, in a, in a hole working on specific tasks and they're very good at it. But, you know, when they start seeing exactly why we do what we do, uh, all of a sudden the light, the light bulb goes on, they start making suggestions as to, well, hey, I know we're working on this, but we could potentially do this and it's a little different. And this will give me visibility into, um, you know, some other aspect of the operating system that we didn't consider. Uh, so all these little things start, you know, ensuring that my team start thinking, um, you know, critically about the problems we're looking to solve and require less direction to start, you know, making informed decisions about what to build and when to build it. Um, I think the CTFs themselves, whether they be, um, and I'll reference your holiday hack challenge. I think the first time I did that was in 2006 and Mike Poore had written one around Star Wars. Oh yes, uh, I remember, yeah. Yeah, it was a good time. It was all Unix based. Um, whether it be um, something that is, in essence, a tabletop exercise of review the data, um, or similar to the, the challenge I wrote where we embedded images in TTLs for ICMP the other day, um, whether it be an individual challenge that they can do in their spare time, or something a little more formal and time consuming, you know, like a cyber range or CTF, um, it brings understanding. It, it, I'm, I'm less concerned about you know, teams winning, um, right. yeah, and then, I'm, I'm, then I am about them gaining knowledge and understanding as to why we do what we do. 
understanding the perspective of the defender, understanding the perspective of the attacker, um, you know, understanding that you know, being an instant responder is very different to being you know, someone who's on a red team, right? Your goals are different. Your, in, you know, while there's an overlap in, in knowledge, um, oftentimes people are coming from different backgrounds when they move into those roles. Um, you know, you'll find that you'll, at least in my experience, the incident responders are traditionally administrators, uh, your pen testers, you know, come from a different background, right? So I think you've opened up a new dimension there. You know, we we're talking about using this for, uh, you know, recruitment, uh, building skills, retention, but, but your point is you also use it for realism and kind of the motivation of why they're doing the job that they do, because it can bring it together in a safe sense. And I think that's powerful. That's, that's really cool. Um, let's continue on this team front. And if I could go to Carrie next, um, tell us a little bit about the team dynamics on cyber ranges. Uh, what makes for a good team and, and good team interactions? I was, I kind of like what Dean said about, um, you know, understanding, I guess, how the team works together, because that's what I've seen is very important is to establish some kind of boundaries. Like you have to know, who is the person who is the incident responder or who is the person who is the pen tester and then you know which flags are you going after which direction are you going after because if you have one person on a team that is so much farther advanced than the other people of the team the other people aren't going to learn anything um, i mean i've seen a range where the team was getting really frustrated because this one person just took over the whole show. I mean, obviously they were much more advanced, but those kind of things can be found out when you do your, um, your pre range exercises. So I like to take the team and um, put them together. You know, for one thing, you're building the team, you're building the team dynamics because they're all learning together and someone will say, Oh yeah, we did this exercise on this or whatever. So you're building the team there. So they're learning how to work together, who has the stronger skills in one area. And then if they don't pick their own boundaries or own areas to go off in, then, you know, that's where you can kind of come in and take charge and hopefully, um, you know, that you won't have the one person pulling everyone else over because everybody is trying to learn, right? I mean, yeah. so maybe that person needs to be put into a different range to give the other um, people a chance because that advanced person also needs to build their skills and you don't want to limit their curiosity and their abilities by um, putting them with someone with the wrong skills or, you know, with a different skill set. I'm so, glad you brought that up, yeah. yeah. There's a thing that we did, it was a few years ago, um, part of the CyberShield event, we had I don't know, it might have been 20 or 30 different groups of National Guard soldiers, mm -hmm. each a team of 10 from different states. And one of the things that we found there is if the technical, if, if the leader of those 10 people was very technical and did the keyboard stuff, that team would be far less effective than if that leader was very technical and didn't touch the keyboard, but instead instructed other people what to do, or even if the leader wasn't technical and still instructed other people what to do. So the point is, if you're a technical lead, you might want to take a step back and best deploy your forces. Um, this whole team thing can be really kind of neat and fun. Um, Nick, I'd like to, to give this one to you. What's the most fun thing that you've done and your team has done on a, a Cyber Ranger CTF? I mean, you can have a, a, a good time with this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's so many different avenues you can go down, but I would say particularly, um, I really enjoy kind of automating some of the mundane um, elements. Um, so whether it be like the enumeration phase um, or maybe something just as simple as, you know, taking a really complex bash command and writing a really quick, um, you know, alias for it, you know, because we're all hackers at heart, you know, and we're lazy. So typing a really long command you know, if you can do two letters instead of, you know, 30 is, is, is probably better. Um, but I would say it's the most memorable fun time I've had in the cyber range is uh, when a buddy of mine, um, you know, there were several of us in this large scale cyber range and uh, my buddy had beaten me uh, to, to rooting a machine. Um, and when I finally got, you know, that initial user access, um, I thought it was going to be a really instant, you know, easy, you know, privilege escalation win to, to root it, you know, and get your little root dance going. Yeah. yeah. Um, but my buddy had left some breadcrumbs leading me down a, a rabbit hole. Um, so, you know, once I finally figured it out, you know, we both had a good laugh about it, but um, you know, it was just, a, it was a really fun experience. And I think 
at the end of the day, you know, if you're having fun while you're, you know, engaging with, you know, these, these CTFs, these, these ranges, then you want to participate in them and learning just is going to occur naturally. That's it's gamification. That's what it's all about. If people should be enjoying it, it'll make them want to learn and develop their skills. Really cool. I'd like to go to David next. You know, David, you have such a fascinating background. You've done so many different things. You've got forensics, you've got red teaming. How does your diverse background of skill sets, blue, red, forensics, impact what you're looking for in getting value out of cyber ranges? Um, sure. So it depends on the range, right? So for CCDC, uh, on an operator perspective, I'm not looking for someone who has an OSCB, for example. Why? Yeah. There's lots of people out there they can get in. That's not our game. Our game on a multi-day event as a uh, as a known attacker against defenders is that you have to be able to get in. Sure, it's it, it's possible you can do it, but stay in. And so it's finding those people who can develop not only new persistence techniques and skills, but do the research to figure out ways to be able to persist silently. For instance, the the wonderful years when Windows didn't display uh, didn't display STCP traffic, mm -hmm. man. Those were great years for us. Um, in that yeah. fact, Nick, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was <laughs> one of our it's one of our tricks there in the, in the early years. Yeah. Um, so on the on the red team side, yeah, it's it's about building those teams' capabilities, uh, and then you know, as Dean and and Carrie were saying, building those teams. That's one of my responsibilities: assigning the teams. We have dedicated red teams per student team. Um, I have to mix those skill sets up to make sure that I have an equal balance across it. But I'm also getting like sponsors from Jason's organization. You know, they're they're sponsoring our organization for getting. Uh, you know, people either from their offensive or their IR side, and I'm matching them up, make sure not only they have a good experience, but they can learn something and actually bring something to each one of these experiences. And then on the other side, on like the, the KPMG side, when we have our employees and we're doing CTS with them or we're deploying CTS for customers, again, it's all about that learning objective because we have IR CTFs, we have DFR CTFs, and we have offensive CTFs, but it really is on the, on the learning goal, you know, on, and I would say for CCDC, the two learning goals we always have for our students is, can you learn to be a threat hunter? Can you learn to find science of intrusion? And then can you do IR? Can you put out the flame and find root cause? That's pretty awesome. Let, let's go to Jason next. Uh, so Jason, you know, we talked about this recruitment stuff and I, I know that your team, you got an amazing team, but you're building, right? You're always looking for good talent. So when you're building your team and finding new talent, how do you take into account an applicant's experience with CTFs? How meaningful is that to you? Um, what do you do with it? What kinds of things are you looking for? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that ways is we're going through the process of looking for talent, Ed. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that, right? The first of which, um, you know, our organization and our folks um, are pretty heavily engaged in CTFs. It's a, a, a part of our culture, um, especially for a lot of our blue teamers. Um, and, and so when somebody comes in and they show that they have an interest in that area, obviously that means they'll probably be a good culture fit. Um, the other thing is, I, I think seeing the individuals that have that strong desire um, to have gone off on their own and gain that hands-on experience, I think is really important as well. Um, you know, I, I, I was talking to somebody just a couple of weeks ago, yeah. um, and they were talking about, and this is not a knock against any, any higher education programs, right? And I won't name the institution specifically, but they were taking a, a database security class, and certainly that's a harder problem to solve when you're talking about bringing labs and other things into that kind of curriculum, but they'd taken a database security class and, and they hadn't actually seen or touched or, or interacted with or had any kind of hands-on experience um, with any databases a part of that class, right? Um, and, and so when you look at that versus the skill set that's gained through some of the cyber ranges and the CTFs, um, you know, and somebody's actually living it and going through it, I, I think that brings a lot of value to the applicant. Yeah, definitely. That's really cool. I, I, I The same thing on me. My, when I'm hiring, I'm looking, what have you played? What yeah. have you learned from what you played? What evidence do I have that you've played? And right. I, I don't need your score, but I want to see that you learned something in it, right? Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. Ed. I don't care where you ended up on the leaderboard necessarily. The fact that you took the initiative and you're participating and you're showing a desire to learn, I think that's critical. That's really cool. Awesome. Thanks. Let's, let's move to Dean next. Uh, so Dean, um, you had mentioned, you know, taking some courses. You also mentioned some cyber range activities and CTFs. How do you characterize the differences in what you're looking for and what people learn in traditional courses, lecture and labs versus cyber ranges and CTFs? Um, Obviously you need both, but how do you differentiate the learning outcomes of those, those two kinds of activities? So uh, gosh, um, 
I'm less, I'm less concerned with folks taking an exam at the end of the course. I really mm -hmm. am. I, you know, I mean, I would assume that, you know, if they, they're spending a week or two weeks or three months in a course, they're going to, they're going to gain some knowledge, right? Depending on the technical expertise of that person. Um, for example, I don't expect my UI UX teams, you know, to, to win a CTF, right? Um, you know, some of the guys are incredibly talented, but that's not their background. Um, so when I look at what I expect out of a course or a CTF, um, it's, it's a number of things. It's, um, you know, it's, it's sort of transference of knowledge. Uh, we have a lot of senior folks on the team, um, seeing the, that transfer of knowledge between that senior person and a more junior person. Uh, seeing knowledge applied is probably the most critical for me, uh, which is really what, whether it be a simple hack me um, or something as, as you know, complex as a long running CTF, uh, when people get to apply that knowledge, um, you, know, you see true understanding at that point. Um, and so for me, that's probably how I like to judge things versus you know, is there a way I can grade you know, person's success at, um, at a CTF or their success, you know, at taking a number of courses, right? And um, I think we can all agree that, uh, you know, real world experience counts, counts for a lot more than, you know, a certification uh, or the alphabet soup behind the person's name. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, for folks that I don't ever expect to be an incident responder or a forensic analyst uh, or a pen tester, um, you know, my expectations for what I would consider success in the training that we've offered them or put them through or, you know, encourage them to take is, is really around understanding and seeing that applied back to product, um, you know, and seeing that applied back to uh, the organization itself. Now, most of my team are not practitioners in the classic sense that, you know, um, for example, Jason, your team, I'm familiar with a number of the guys, um, they're practitioners, right? They live their day you know, defending against, you know, defending a two and a half million, you know, person network against God knows how many different people, right? Um, that's a practitioner. So for me, it's when my, my team understand the role of the practitioner, um, can, you know, empathize uh, with the practitioner and the difficulties in their day uh, and use that to design better product. Um, and I, I see that success when I have a um, most recently, one of my UX team working on a, sort of a, broad, a scalable endpoint technology, um, you know, came back with a suggestion on how to present data. Um, you know, and we're talking about the wealth of data. You know, if you pull back, um, I don't know, process, you know, process trees from 10,000 systems, it's not that easy to, to mine that data, right? But at some point, someone needs to mine it. So for the UX person to turn around and say, look, I see this as a problem. Um, if I was in this person's shoes, I wouldn't know where to begin. Um, we can't only allow for, you know, the first page of data to be exported. They need to export the entire thing. Now, it might seem like common sense to say, well, export all 10,000, you, know, um, you know, process tree dumps um, for those systems and mine it elsewhere. But, you know, oftentimes the UX person is not thinking in those terms. They're thinking about data presentation on the screen and not yeah. what happens off the screen. Uh, so, that's how we judge success in, in, in the teams going through these processes, they're taking these classes, taking these, these CTFs. Um, and you know, over time, it starts to increase as well. And you see people then starting to do things on their own uh, and take initiative. Oh, that's, that's great stuff, Dean. Hey, just uh, so you guys know, I'm in the middle of a very big electric storm. I'm running off of generator right now. So if I disappear, uh, we have six minutes left. Each of you share one minute of just amazing knowledge that you have, right? <laughs> That's how we're going to finish anyway. But before we finish on that, I'd like to talk with Carrie. You know, we're talking about ranges can do this, ranges can do that, CTFs can do this, they're useful this way and that way. But there's some limitations, Carrie. I mean, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what ranges can't do in CTFs with respect to learning outcomes and, and how we might seek, you know, more traditional training or, or other forms of, of uh, learning besides training and ranges. Thoughts? So some of the things, you know, that ranges are very good at is um, there are a lot of different ranges that can teach you basic skills and they're, you know, they have a lot of instantiations that you can just spin up and, and teach basic things. But if you're trying to put a defense team together, um, it may be tough to replicate that operational environment on a range. You know I mean? Because every infrastructure is different and so it may not have the same look and feel as something else. So 
if you're past the point where you're um, teaching more advanced skills and you really want your team to practice, you know, new tools or maybe a new device um, on something that's similar to their own network, especially when you start getting into classified networks. And, um, you know, I think that's where you start to see a separation between what a range can do and can't do. And then that's where you have to have your own range um, in order to be able to test TTPs or, you know, that are local and specific to your own organization. Um, and the other things too is, you know, if, if you um, are only looking at pen testing ranges, but you have a bunch of defenders, I think it was Dean that said, you know, similar skills and there is some overlap, but when you're defending, you're defending in a known network. You know, this is my network. I know what this looks like. I know what it feels like. So I can pick out something that's different. If I'm a, you know, defender on a pen testing range, then I'm not, I'm getting some skills, but I'm not practicing what I need to be doing is defending a network. Um, so I think that's the, that's the thing is that not all infrastructures look the same and, and those are the challenges. Um, oh, the other thing too is, uh, depending on the, the bulkiness of your infrastructure, <laughs> yep. you may have challenges with, you know, more than four or five people on your range. I mean, I know some of these larger ranges don't have those problems like CCDC, but when you're talking about smaller ranges um, at schoolhouses or in these other places, um, you know, you might have a challenge in transferring um, uh, files or um, VMs across, you know, slow links and Concurrency and stability are always a, a big deal when it comes to ranges. Uh, we're going to do a panel a little bit later uh, with range designers talking about those very issues. But you bring up a really interesting point, Carrie, and I've seen this happen in a lot of ranges. And this is another use case that we haven't yet discussed here, except for Carrie just kind of brought it up. And that is evaluating your own TTPs, right? I mean, you can apply them in a range environment and say, wow, this one sucked, <laughs> right? So we can't do it this way. Um, you know, or, or this one was good, this one's solid, or this one is inefficient, maybe there's a way we can be better. So it's not just learning, your people learning, it's you evaluating your own playbooks and your TTPs. So let's, let's kind of close this out uh, with each person. One minute, please, if you can limit yourself to one minute. We'll start with Jason. Just uh, give us some knowledge. So something really useful, interesting about ranges that you'd like to share with folks. Yeah, no, I would just encourage people led, um, as they're going through this process, and if you're participating in CTFs and ranges, um, approach it with the spirit of having fun. Um, and don't be afraid of how you look to others. And, and I'll, I'll give you a real world example of that uh, because I haven't been really that technical in quite some time. And I was over at uh, the Hackfest pen test conference. It was some time ago, uh, Ed, where we went to the National Cryptologic Museum. Yes. Uh, yeah, there was cookies and, and adult beverages there afterwards, and we had the place to ourselves. Um, but at that at that uh, conference, I was taking the 561 class, and I, I had at that time Tim Medina as an instructor. Yep. Um, and I was by far the least technical person on the team, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we had a lot of fun. I added value where I could add value, which was more of trying to keep things on track and trying to keep things organized and making sure people were working on the right things. Um, and we had a team there that was much more technical if you looked at the median level than our team. Uh, and we ended up with a coin. Nice. Um, yeah. And, you know, if you look at Net Wars afterwards, which was a fantastic experience, definitely I'm not one of the folks that would end up on the leaderboard. Uh, but just going in, having a great time, having some chips and beer, um, and being able to participate in that process and meet people and hang out with them. Um, so I would just encourage everybody to have fun um, and not worry about where you're at in the leaderboard and look at it more as the journey instead of where you end up um, at the end from a point perspective. It's so good, Jason. I tell you, you know, as a range de designer and builder, I'm always reminding my team because it's just so natural to focus on, you know, the top 10 players and make sure that they were really challenged and they really enjoyed themselves. And look, that's important. I'm, I'm with sure. you on that. But I always tell my team, I want the person who comes in 109th place to say, you know what? I got a lot out of that. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, so so that, that's a, a really good thing for you to share. Thank you, Jason. Let's move to David next. David, what nugget do you want to share with us? So I would say for those that are doing offensive CTS, especially those playing net wars of any flavor, don't think that the objective is to answer the question correctly and you're looking for a solution. The point of it is self-learning, learning how to find the answer to the question. So if you're sitting in chat and you're saying, hey, can anybody help me with this? 
there's a reason that we're getting vague. We want you to figure it out for yourself because that's what you need to do in the real world. And for the CCDC competitors out there who are watching this, um, there's no useful hints you can get from this and we will see you next year. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> it's all hints all the way down. <laughs> hey Nick, would you share something with us please? Sure. Um, so I'd say like the number one takeaway is just continue to advance your own skills because you know at the end of the day, you know, if you're continuing to take courses, take CTFs, uh, participate in CTFs or ranges, you know, you're advancing your own skill set, and you know that's what's going to pay dividends for your career, uh, for your organization, and ultimately the clients that you're supporting. But how you can do that effectively, I would say, and this has been a theme throughout this entire uh, virtual summit, is take excellent notes. Mm -hmm. um, so my three takeaways on how to take excellent notes are use a cloud-enabled backup uh, service such as OneNote. Um, Joplin is a very popular one that's coming up. Um, you don't want to lose your notes once you type really effective notes. Uh, map a, a keyboard shortcut so you can take screenshots within a virtual machine and just paste it into your, your OneNote uh, or, or whatever note-taking service you're using. Um, and then log your terminal so you can refer back to that later. Though the combination of those uh, will usually force you to take excellent notes that you can refer back to later and can, you know, continue the learning cycle. I love it. Very practical. Thank you. Hey, Carrie, you got one minute of stuff? Yes, I do. Um, so I guess I take this from a different point of view because um, it seems like I'm always asking for money to support the ranges. So uh, <laughs> I'm taking it from another view is like um, make sure that you have learning outcomes and that you have an intent that is solid so that, hey, we took team A from this level to this level and these are the skills that, that we learned and this is what I would like to do next. So you, you have a measure of success or you have a measure of um, where you were and where you want to get to. And then that way, you know, that's your justification for um, being able to get the team to, uh, you know, because they have day jobs, being able to get the team to actually t take time to train and then also getting the funding to support um, range and range improvements so that you can keep assisting and helping to grow that knowledge and keep the people interested, you know, I mean, I know. Yeah. They're fun. That's great. Being meaningful and, and purposeful. Yep. Hey, Dean, why don't you close us out with uh, one minute of stuff here? Um, I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, I will say this, uh, and this is somewhat of a, a, a paraphrase of a quote I think Jack Welsh made a, uh, a number of years ago. Um, uh, the only thing worse than training your team uh, or training an individual on your team and having them leave is not training them and having them stay. Yes. Um, I think we have an obligation to everyone on our teams uh, to provide them as much training and knowledge as possible. If they move on to bigger and better things, you get to say that you had a hand in that. If they stick around, uh, you get to build an incredible team that's going to then pay, you know, pay back dividends, you know, year over year. And, you know, those junior folks will come in, you know, learn from those senior folks and it'll simply grow that way. So that would be my only takeaway here. What a great way to, to close out this panel. That was really awesome. You guys were fantastic. Jason, I'm sorry I embarrassed you at the start with reading about how great you are, but but really, you guys are fantastic. And I think the audience now understands that. Um, you're going to be heading over into that Slack channel. It's the one called hall, hallway-panel-maximizing the value. Uh, that, so if you go over there for that, we'd appreciate it. Also, please do fill out your session feedback. We really do want to hear from you. Uh, and thank you, all of our fantastic panelists. It was just so good to talk with you. I really enjoyed that. Yeah.